Pam and Mike Dorsey have been great friends of ours since the late 60s. Back then, Pam was working at Channel 9 in Sydney and Mike was an established actor. Mike, I know you came from England originally. How did you end up in Australia? I brought the Rolling Stones out. I was a tour manager. So, <laughs> you were the tour manager of the most famous rock and roll band in the world. I took them all over the world, um, which is how I came to Australia. And one trip here decided you? Well, I'd, I'd been here before with the Stones, up in Queensland somewhere, fell in love with the place, went back to England and then South Africa. When did you switch from being a tour manager to an actor? Uh, amateur dramatics. And I decided it was an easy way to earn a living because all you had to do was remember the bloody lines and deliver them. So I did. So where did you meet Pam? London. I drove her home. She lived in Sterndale Road with Audrey Barber, Chris Barber's sister. And um, I said to her as we went down to the roundabout at Hammersmith, if we turn left, I go to your house. If we turn right, I know a great motel. And she said, you're driving. And so <laughs> that's how it started. <laughs> When did you first meet David? When did I first meet David? You better ask David that, because I don't remember. <laughs> the Don Lane Show. Yeah, it could be Don Lane Show, yeah. Don was a very good mate of mine. I remember you were living at Duffy's Forest at the time. It was way out of Sydney in those days. It's probably a close suburb of Sydney now, but in those days, it was really out in the country. And we, we rented a lovely little cottage and five acres. And when we first moved in, there were stables down the bottom of the garden, so we thought we'd better get a horse to put in them. So we did. And you, you hadn't, I don't think, you'd done any horse riding at all until then. And you jumped on a horse and away you went and you never stopped. Yeah, that was the start of my illustrious equestrian career. And I can remember you two doing it in the middle of the night one night. You had a, a light horse, right. grey, and I had a dark brown horse. And I, I fell off, I think. And you, I think you fell off. I couldn't figure out where the hell the bloody horse was. <laughs> Those were the magic days. They were magic days. Yeah. Absolutely. It was, it was great. And every weekend the house was full again. You bought a house near Channel 10, and I guess that's because you were in a series there. Number 96, which Bill Harmon said, yeah, Mike, as a role for you. Uh, you know, heard, yeah, sure, Bill and uh, we played golf together. It was a huge success. You, you must have really loved it. I was told I did a good job on it, but um, as daddy, mm. learned your lines on a Sunday morning with, with Pam doing the feed. I had to look at the script and help him, uh, which didn't take much because he was a very good quick learner in those days. That was, as David Sale, one of the writers, said, it was the day that Australian television lost its virginity. Yes. I did enjoy being in number 96 because the cast, 90% of the cast were great. There were a few that Mike didn't like and a few that most people didn't like, but the majority of the cast and the crew, were, well, the crew were always great. It was, it was a good time. It was a great time. Mike didn't like being recognised in the street very often, but um, yeah, that was the way things were. That's the quality. <laughs> he never called himself famous. He was always fairly modest. Not totally, but... No, that's stretching. Yeah, it is a bit, isn't it? <laughs> and we, en we enjoyed it. We enjoyed the lifestyle. You also performed on stage with a famous actor. Robert Morley, 
um, how the other half loves. I did I six months, I think, with him. Very good. Um, somebody said to him, Robert, what do you do? And he said, uh, to whom? <laughs> I, I, I've often used that line. And somebody says to me, what do you do? And I say, I don't know. Yeah, Robert was a very good friend. In the 70s, you had a huge change of direction. You moved to Western Australia and you were involved with an emerald mine and I think the famous Sons of Gwalia gold mine. There's very little to tell, actually. Um, the guy that owned it, and I've forgotten his name, do forgive me, and I said to him, um, I'm going to give you a quarter of a million dollars tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and you either say yes or no. He couldn't wait to say yes. Mm. And from that point on, I became chairman of Sons of Gwalia. The same company that uh, an American president was also on the board of. So I have something in common with American presidents. And then from gold mines back to television, but with a difference. I can't remember quite how it started, but somebody suggested to Mike that uh, there was a television station available for buy for purchasing. Kalgoorlie. Yeah. Kalgoorlie. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I owned it for nearly two years, <laughs> then sold it. He bought bought it for one and a half million, and it was the Kalgoorlie station, but they broadcast from Perth to Kalgoorlie and then back down to Esperance again. That's a huge area. They had no programs, no nothing. And within a week of Mike walking in and changing the entire building, and he didn't sack anybody, there was nobody to sack, but he hired a lot of very good people. And it worked very well, and less than two years later, we sold it for seven million. Who's counting? <laughs> do you miss the stage and the screen? I'd, I'd like to do another role, but there aren't that many roles for old degenerates, you know. Um, I wish there were, because uh, I flatter myself. I have never, ever in my life carried a script. Never will. If I don't know the lines, I won't do them. And I knew the lines, you know, backwards. No regrets. No regrets, no. Mike has had an amazing career, starting from an orphanage through the revolution of British rock and roll, then stage and television, screen, uh, mining, and finally owning a television station.